Hello and welcome to episode 96. It's a pleasure today to be joined by, and I can ask him to help me a little bit, Frank Garidi. Am I saying that correctly, sir? You are. Right? I did my homework. I listened a little bit. And, you know, it's one of those, it seems fairly simple, but, you, you know, I don't want to mess it up. But it's a pleasure to have you. We were, uh, you know, talking a little bit before we started recording. And you're over there in the beautiful New York City. I'm here in Sacramento. And it's a pleasure to talk to you. And I know it's a little bit later at night. So thanks so much for your time. How are you today? You know, I'm good. The, the world is, uh, is in constant crisis, certainly as it's been over the last almost two years, but I'm, I'm blessed to be healthy and, uh, and good and employed, and I'm, I'm happy to talk to you today. Same. I appreciate that. Yeah, I remember, especially at the very beginning of the pandemic, where every email was like, I hope this finds you well. <laughs> <laughs> it became very hard to do those ritualistic kinds of things, because especially early on, you know, the pandemic you know, at least became a big news story and the big crisis in this country really started in New York in March and April of 2020. Mm, and right. uh, nothing seemed, you know, like adequate to how do you ask people yeah. how they're doing when they're literally worried about dying? You know, you know, so it was, uh, yes, it's been, it's been tough to carry on those kind of rituals. And I've adopted some new ways of doing, you know, say, greeting people and saying hello and goodbye mm -hmm. as a result. No doubt about it. Yeah, and I'm you know very lucky to be able to talk to to great writers and thinkers like yourself. Like you said, there are much bigger issues in the world right now. Um, carving out some time for a great discussion is is the least of them. It's very edifying. I appreciate it. Right. So you talked about a little bit of time living in the West Coast, and and I know you were a professor at U, U of T. My, I feel like such a, a a gringo or outsider. You know, U of T. Did he say it like that? I don't know. No, it's uh, U T Austin, the University of Austin. Texas Austin. Yes, right. but most people in academia call it U T Austin, and people in Texas call it U T Austin because it's the flagship, you know, public uh, university in uh, in Texas. Which I was reminded again with with the book Sports Revolution. We're going to talk about a little bit later. As good as it is about how Texas really is its its own thing. Texas is its you know it's it's a it's its own entity, but. Um, but, you know, growing up in New York City, um, I'd love to know what, you know, your relationship with, with language was. Was it a print rich environment? Was it monolingual? Was it, you know, English only mm -hmm. or were you bilingual? Um, just your relationship with, with, with words. Yeah, so I'm the child of a working class uh, Afro-Latino family, you know, uh, immigrant on my father's side. He came here from the Dominican Republic in, 19, in the mid-1950s. Mm. Uh, my mother was a, what you would call a New Yorkian, um, ah. born in New York City, but you know her mother came from uh, Puerto Rico in 1941. So, um, so at the, you know I was you know I was not from a you know a highly you know formally educated family. You know, in fact, my parents uh, you know barely got to high school, right? So, but they read. Uh, and my dad, you know, loved history. My mom was, is very religious. So reading was a, very much a part of our, our life. You know, my mother was an avid reader of the Bible. Mm. And one of the things that I learned, you know, I'm not religious now, but certainly what I learned from Bible study and things like that was, uh, you know, how to interpret texts, right? right? So there was a real value on, you know, not just going to church and believing God, but, but literally, you know, reading and trying to understand your faith, right? Uh, in addition to doing the, the rituals that one would associate with the, with the you know, Christian religions. Hey, my dad loved history. He loved sports. So, um, um, you know, so there were books in the house that uh, I remember even looking at, uh, you know, they read the Arbogri of Malcolm X, hmm. you know, when the, in the 1960s and 70s, when they were coming up in New York City. So books were around, um, but I, you know, I, 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 you know, and, and our household was, was bilingual. It's interesting because mm -hmm. uh, my parents spoke Spanish. Uh, my grandparents didn't speak any English or very little English, mm. uh, but my parents didn't speak English to me. Uh, and I'm sorry, they didn't speak Spanish to me, uh, not because they didn't want me to know Spanish, but I think they just got so, so accustomed to having serious conversations among themselves where they don't want my brother and I to hear what they were saying. <laughs> so they gave us this inadvertent kind of message that we don't want you to know Spanish, even though that's not what they really, uh, that was not their truest desire. So uh, I, but I, I heard Spanish, I understood it, but I didn't become fully fluent until I was uh, in my twenties when I was going to Cuba doing my research in my first book. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, you know, um, you know, I, you know, my, like I said, my parents didn't go to college, you know, the, the whole notion of getting a PhD, which I got eventually was not even something, you know, fathomable, certainly growing up. Um, but there was an appreciation for text and for history. 
And, and for culture and music, uh, you know, my parents and my father in particular was a huge music head, uh, listening to all kinds of things, you know, very eclectic mix. And, uh, and I was blessed to grow up in New York where, you know, it's even in the Bronx where I grew up in the, in the 70s and 80s, you know, there was a real emphasis on, on public culture and literacy and things like that. Public libraries were accessible, you know, so, um, you know, so there was a culture that appreciated literature uh, even if, you know, it wasn't a situation where my parents, you know, were raised in an academic environment. Mm. Oh, thank you for that. Um, interesting to know, you know, all the different ways that people come to being bilingual, you know, mm -hmm. um, spoke to, you know, spoken to so many people who have said, oh, you know, I unfortunately did not learn Spanish or whatever the mother tongue was because of, you know, because of racism, because of Mom yes. was hit in school when she spoke the language yes. and that kind of thing. That's what happened to my mom. You know, my mom, I mean, she kept her Spanish, but uh, she was very much derided as a Puerto Rican in the 1950s and 60s uh, for speaking Spanish. Mm -hmm. And that was her generation's struggle. Um, you know, I, I'm sort of a one and a half generation sure. since, you know, so, right. uh, so, you know, by the time I came along, there was an emphasis, but certainly among Caribbean Latinos in New York to speak Spanish. But, you know, as a nature of being in this country and being in an English, you know, dominant society, you know, it wasn't something that I was able to really fully master until I decided to go to graduate school in part because I wanted to know Spanish. Mm -hmm. And I knew I needed an immersion experience and I knew it was very important to my culture and history. And that, so I made it a mission to do that, you know, uh, and I'm glad I did because, uh, you know, it really it was something that I had set, set a, as a goal for myself. Definitely. In, in a couple words, I mean, is the key immersion? I mean, did you feel like that was the way to learn? Like that's immersion is the best way? Yes, yes. Uh, and you could immerse yourself in New York City, certainly at the time. But, um, but you know, I, I, we lived in, you know, actually we lived in very multi-ethnic neighborhoods. So Spanish was just one of a number of languages you would sure. hear in the neighborhoods I grew up in. You know, you would hear English spoken in different ways. There were a lot of people from the Anglophone Caribbean, like Jamaica and Barbados and Trinidad. Like that was a whole other kind of English uh, and other kinds of languages in my neighborhood. You had a lot of uh, Jewish people of different European descent. You know, there was all kinds of languages spoken by them. So, you know, even if I didn't master Spanish, I was very much accustomed to, you know, appreciating, you know, the different kinds of languages I would I would hear every single day in the Bronx. Mm, interesting. Interesting. Did your did your father have. I mean, I would assume you had to have some sort of experiences with Trujillo or. The yes, effect. yes, yes, they did. So they came, you know, toward the end of his dictate. Well, I guess the last seven years of his dictatorship. <laughs> okay. And um, he was, of course, assassinated in 1961. Uh, so, yes. And, and the Trujillo, you know, legacy of my family is profound because I think, you know, like all people who are living in authoritarian societies, you know, the consequences of that, of that experience is to sometimes to not remember or mm -hmm. selectively or willingly forget certain things about your past. Mm -hmm. And I jokingly say that uh, I became a historian, you know, I, I became an academic historian, and I'm a historian who writes for a broader audience now, because I didn't know my family history, you know, because a lot of it was really silenced by, I think, by the traumas of the dictatorship, uh, and whatever entangled relationships that my father's side had with it. And then on my grandmother's side from Puerto Rico, you know, she lived to Puerto Rico in the Great Depression, extremely difficult crisis moment in the island's history. She was a poor woman from the southeastern part of the island. Mm. And, you know, when she came to the States, you know, like some immigrants, she's like, I, she didn't want to know anything about Puerto Rico after that. You know, like when I went to Puerto Rico in my 20s, she's like, why are you doing that? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because I wanted to know my own history, because, you know, it, it was it was passed on in everyday culture mm -hmm. uh, and language. But in terms of recalling events from the past, not so much, you know, sure. uh, and so. You know, a lot of immigrants to New York at the time, certainly they had deep connections to the, to the homeland, to the islands. But my family, once they came to, to the States, they, those ties were pretty much severed, certainly soon after their arrival, you know, and that had an impact on me, right. you know. Right. Yeah, I don't, I, you use the word entangled. I don't know what to, to do with all the, <laughs> with all of the, the links, you know, with, I think of uh, the, the ballad of Oscar Wow or the, mm -hmm. you know, the Juno Diaz. Yes. Obviously, you know, he's there's issues there to say the least, but just that description of you're talking about of the traumas. Yes. Uh, you know, he goes all the way back to like, you know, centuries. Yes. But, and just like you talk about just the traumas and how unfortunately there was there was a there's a gap there's a there's something missing there. there is and you know and even you know as now that i'm a professional historian you know it's very hard to reconstruct dominican history from that period because archives 
don't exist uh, or, you know, because it's an impoverished country, they don't have the resources to preserve them. But, you know, most authoritarian regimes don't keep records <laughs> or what, they don't desire right. to keep records of their of what of their rule. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, and, and so, you know, that that has its effect on the writing of Dominican history. And so we go to things like fiction in order to recreate it in the ways that Juno Diaz did and the ways that uh, as which Danticat does with her writings with the, you know, Haitian Dominican relations, among other. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Haiti has a very similar dynamic. So that's why actually we have to go to fiction sometimes in novels and music to recreate uh, or imagine what the past was, because sometimes the archival record doesn't doesn't tell us. I'll never look at the word perejil the same yeah. way. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. Right? That's right. That's right. Perejil, right? The word that they use to supposedly to identify uh, Haitians. Uh, um, that's what the, the Trujillo regime did uh, in massacring 30,000 Haitians in 1937. Um, well, real and imagined Haitians, as historians have shown, sure. right? I mean, um, so um, either way, yes, one of those many infamous incidents from, from his 31 years of, in power yeah. in the DR. Man. Yeah. Man, I mean, even, 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 you know, similar to like, I'm not a, an expert on on Soviet Union, but like, um, I guess Stalin, you know, but the idea of like literally changing history, right? There, yes. there, didn't they change the city's names to Trujillo? Yes, and, absolutely. So uh, Santo know. Domingo used to be called Ciudad Trujillo, Trujillo ah, City. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and if, as my father would say, and as many people who lived in the DR that period would say, if you didn't have a portrait of, of, uh, of the great... Um, uh headed out through hero in your living room then people would come for you you know it was wow. that kind of situation yes that's right wow. uh and wow. so yeah it was uh you know and unfortunately my grandfather his father died when i was 17 so i never had a chance i wish i mean i'm a historian can you imagine all the questions i would have asked him but he died you know when i was young uh, as a teenager and so i never had a chance to, to really understand what his relationship was Oh to that regime and how he survived. Um, sure. And, uh, you know, I, I can't help but think that part of the reason why they came here was to get away from it. But again, I, that's really speculation. speculation. You know, my dad was very young when he got here, so it's still not clear to me, sure. uh, even now, uh, you know, why they decided to settle in New York. Huh. Well, on a much lighter note. Uh, yes. <laughs> you know, what, what were you reading, you know, in, you know, childhood into adolescence? I mean, were you a sci-fi sci guy? Were you into... You know, you read, you write a little bit about sports. You write a lot about mm -hmm. everything. I mean, were you writing reading sports? Were you reading S.C. Hinton? Were you reading, you know, what, what were you into? I was, I was, and I'm, I'm still a nonfiction person. Mm. You know, I'm embarrassed to admit that um, I didn't read a lot of novels growing up. Um, you know, um, I mean, just because, you know, I teach at an Ivy League institution, I'm supposed to, you know, have read all the great works of literature. Um, but I think, again, that's also about my class background and also about my education background. And I'll get back to that in a minute. But for whatever reason, I gravitated to nonfiction history. Uh, and, and that's what I do now. Uh, and I think um, partly, so part of it was about sports. So, uh, you know, I remember walking to the library when I was in second grade and picking up some book was like a, some, you know, some, it's kind of a, a juvenile uh, biography of Wilma Rudolph, the great black uh, ah. Olympian, right? And then this one next to that, Mean Joe Green, the defensive tackle for the Pittsburgh Steelers in the 1970s. And I just flew through those sports biographies oh, yeah. for whatever reason. And I, and, and I also, that's when I was starting to become a sports fan of getting into sports mm -hmm. and starting to play sports when I was seven or eight years old. And so I flew through, I mean, all kinds of sports books. Mm -hmm. And then I was into kind of presidential histories, you know, because that was sort of our popular understanding of history is, you know, kind of political history. I was really into the Kennedys. Mm -hmm. I was really into the Kennedy assassination in my youth. I still am endlessly fascinated by that uh -huh. big, great mystery of American history. You know, yeah. what happened on, November 22nd, 1963. Mm. Um, uh, and so, um, so I was reading things like that. I, I used to get on the train uh, and go down to this bookstore uh, in Manhattan in the Grand Central Station. And I would just go there with my allowance money, you know, every so often in my, you know, early adolescent years and into my teenage years and buy the latest biography of whatever, Reggie Jackson. Um, you know, a book that really made an impression on me was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's autobiography, Giant Steps. Okay. I don't know if you know that book, but Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the legendary basketball player, also activist, historian. And that book, Giant Steps, really spoke to me because I, I start to understand myself as a Black Caribbean person growing up in New York like him, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, granted, he's older than me, but uh, the way he wrote about growing up in New York, riding on the subways, trying to find himself as a young man, granted, he's 
he was a he's an extraordinarily talented seven foot man. Exactly. I was not that. Um, <laughs> But the but the way he brought in kind of you know politics, uh, his coming to his racial awareness, the way he talked about jazz, you know, like I've I've come back to that book. I mean, I have it here. It's like half. It's like out of print, right? So it's like ripped in half. But I still go back to it once in a while when I want to get a sense of something that was going on in New York at that time, right? So he gives you kind of a a, a view of New York sure. life growing up, and those are the passages that really spoke to me. In addition to the ones about his you know his playing days and also his his struggles. To be a black athlete in this country in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Um, so that was a book that really made a big pr impression on me. Um, you know, again, not literary, but certainly as somebody who was trying to understand himself in the early 80s in New York City, it was a book that really spoke to me. Hmm. Now, there seems to be something so me as a as a visitor, I've visited three or four times, the idea of uh of New York and that and that subway and reading culture, right? I mean, yeah. it's a built-in reading culture. You see people reading. 10, 15 years ago, you, you know, more so the book, but now it's maybe a Kindle electronic, right? There's very, very much something about New York. Am I, am I getting that right? You're exactly right. Uh, you know, um, I, to this day, uh, have very I, I fond um, feelings when I walk into a New York subway, even though uh, it's, it's delayed and, and, and overpacked and, and gross uh, most of the time. And there's construction on the way, right? And there's construction and, you know, I mean, the subway system needs an upgrade uh, to say the least. Um, but as a kid growing up and a kid growing up in an era when kids had more autonomy, you know, we jokingly say I'm a Gen Xer that, you know, we sort of raised us ourselves, which is so, kind of true. I mean, my parents were very much involved in my life, but there was no helicopter parenting in working class Bronx. So I roamed the city, you know, on the buses and, and the trains. And that was that was a that was a wonderful in the 70s and 80s and a period when New York supposedly was not safe and crime ridden. Mm. But um, uh, and it, it, it wasn't. But but that didn't stop us from roaming the streets, <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, and riding the subways and the buses. And for me, it was it was it was a great time, especially when I would come into Manhattan from the Bronx. You know, I was a half hour, 45 minutes, sometimes an hour riding, depending upon how, how deep downtown I went at the time. Um, you know, that was some great alone time to read, to learn, you know, I mean, you want to learn about how life works, just sit in a subway car in New York City for a little while, and you'll get a sense of it, right? And how people interact, how this, the racial geography of the city, how you never saw a white person in the train, you know, and what you were, if you were going north after 96th Street, you know, as the further uptown you went, the more black and brown the, um, uh, the neighborhoods became and the train stops became. So uh, the subway was a, uh, a a great place of learning uh, for me growing up. In you know, in addition to being a place where I could read for sure. Yeah. As as you got older into high school and the college, I wonder when the reading became the writing. When the reading mm -hmm. became something where you're like, you know, I can I can do this. I do this well. Somebody liked mm -hmm. it. You know, <laughs> I can do this for a living. Was that was there a eureka moment or eureka moments? Yeah, there were eureka moments for sure. Um, yeah, I was blessed talk about my family again, but uh, that, you know, even though I'm just sort of a first gen college student, nobody had gone to college. My uncle had gone to college, but other than that, nobody else had been to college in my family that I didn't experience a lot of pressure to go into a lucrative, you know, professional career. Thank goodness. Cause I am not cut out for that at all. <laughs> you know, most of my peers who were going to college were going, you know, going like many people going to the professions, right. So um, law, doctor, et cetera. So, um, so I got very much, uh, you know, politicized. I went to Syracuse, Syracuse University in upstate New York. Um, and I, you know, sort of learned a lot about how race in America works outside of New York City. And uh, I started taking classes uh, on, you know, decolonial theory, on Marxist theory, on, um, on Orientalism, the book by Edward Said, the very famous book that allowed us to understand how the West has, you know, created the image of the other in the East, you know, going back for centuries. Um, and then when I was a junior in college, uh, a letter arrived in my mailbox uh, saying, um, you know, there are opportunities for underrepresented students to go into graduate, go to graduate school and get PhDs. And I was like, oh, wow, maybe I want to do that, <laughs> you know, uh, and it kind of started like that. And, you know, another moment I remember was taking a class with my professor, Horace Campbell, who was a Jamaican political scientist who taught me a lot about Caribbean history. And I'll never forget sometime in the in the fall semester of 1992, walking into his class or he walked in while we were waiting for him. And he said, OK, class, we're going to we're going to we're going to learn from a philosopher today. 
And he puts on, it was probably a cassette because it's 1992 yeah. of Bob Marley's redemption song. Ooh. Right. And uh, I was like, philosopher. What do you mean, philosopher? He's like, no, no, these, these the Rastafari in Jamaica are philosophers. And I was like, wow, the idea that non-elite people could be thinkers, right? To, could be creators of knowledge. Hmm. Uh, I got that from Horace Campbell and a number of people that I read at that time. And it was a very powerful message for somebody from my background, or not from an elite background, a literary background by any means, to actually envision myself as a knowledge producer in the humanities social mm -hmm. sciences it was just not something that i mean it just clicked boom yeah. it was right there yeah. and soon thereafter walking to the library uh and looking at the um you know the call numbers uh right. looking at the african-american studies section and seeing the e-185 call number which is the call number for african-american studies books and seeing the volumes and volumes and volumes of books and journals and articles that have been written about and by black people that's 1992-1993 and that is what and then reading Black thinkers, Black scholars, W.B. Du Bois, uh, Angela Davis, on and on and on, Walter Rodney, uh, C.L.R. James, the great activist and historian who wrote the great book on the Haitian Revolution in the 1930s, mm. The Black Jacobins, right? A book that is, you know, a classic that is still read in academia to this day, right? Uh, our understanding of the, of the slave rebellion that eventually led to the independence and overthrow of slavery and the independence of uh, the creation of Haiti in 1804. Uh, you know, those were those texts uh, that really got me thinking about uh, that one, maybe I could do this. Hmm. And, and even before that, that, you know, we as people of color can do this work, right? Um, and that, you know, most of the time, the stereotype of the professor, or the, uh, the thinker is a person who's not, is a person who's white. And that was a very powerful message for me. Uh, and of course, I read, you know, the great theorists of Western thought in my political sciences class. And those were excellent and wonderful. I actually had a pretty good education, I would say, certainly in political theory and history at Syracuse. But, um, but it was really those moments that I remember very vividly from my late teens, early 20s, that really set me on the path that, I, you know, that I'm on to this day. Wow. Um, were you, was Tobias Wolf at Syracuse when you were there? Maybe. I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. I was there from 89 to 93. It's not ringing a bell. Not sure. I would have known that. Not sure. Yeah. When, when you talk about Bob Marley, um, <laughs> you know, as, I, I remember one, uh, one student a couple years ahead of me, his yearbook quote when I was in high school was, you know, was one of the song, probably some of the lyrics from Redemption Song. And it was mm -hmm. signed as Prophet Bob, right? <laughs> Prophet Bob. Um, but did, you know, especially I think of like, uh, I didn't know what the song was called, but like his like acoustic medley is the way I say yes. it, like on YouTube and yes. Redemption Song. Like, did you did you see the connection to the religiosity of it? You know, like the stone that the builder refused. Like you talk about, like you know, like symbolism and the allegory. Did you see? That? I did because you know Horace Campbell, my professor, was a scholar of Rastafari. Right, his book, one of his books, was called Rasta and Resistance, uh, from Marcus Garvey to to uh, Walter Rodney. I think was the full title of the book. And so you know, he started that class, you know, on with Marley as his way to get into his discussion mm. of the Rastafari movement and its importance in Jamaica and its importance in Black culture in Africa and its importance in again in you know poor at least originally you know jamaicans and other folks you know creating their own you know their own religion essentially or their own belief system but tied into the politics uh, uh and particularly the cultural politics of jamaica at the time mm -hmm. so like i had a deep dive sure. and as a new yorker you know i i had a i had an awareness of you know jamaican culture given that jamaicans were in my neighborhood growing up right mm -hmm. so but i didn't know that history at all mm -hmm. So, so yes, the spiritual aspects, the importance of, you know, spirituality, Rastafari and African spirituality, you know, beyond, you know, Jamaica and other, other parts of the African diaspora, right, which became stuff that I wanted reading about quite a bit in my graduate uh, training in, in, um, at the University of Michigan. So, um, yeah, and I think that that's, the, that was a foundational experience for me, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, 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 you know, a kid or a younger person know your age at the time in 2021 would not be maybe as surprised or would be more used to seeing you know writers of color on yes. the shelves did when you were younger even did you like is that something you could have articulated that maybe you didn't necessarily feel represented or you just like didn't even think to think of it or how you know what i mean that's a great question you know i think i gravitated to sports because i saw people of color prominent all the time 
you know, by the time I'm coming up in the 70s and 80s, mm-hmm. Major League Baseball has been desegregated for 30 years after Jackie Robinson, right? Uh, you know, uh, basketball was a de facto black sport. Um, you know, I play, you know, I grew up in the Bronx in the midst of the hip hop revolution, <laughs> you know, so I was very much in touch with my culture my, or the various cultures culture. that I inhabited for sure. Right. But in terms of text, not so much because, you know, I went to uh, public schools uh, in the Bronx and they were fine enough until I got to high school. And by the time I got to high school in the late eighties, high school was an alienating experience to me, you know, uh, and I felt really understimulated. Uh, and there were occasionally a good teacher here and there, but it was a school that was really in decline by the time I got to the school. I went to Harry S. Truman high school in the Bronx. And because it was in the midst of what, you know, scholars of cities have called and historians of white flight, where a formerly integrated school was rapidly becoming predominantly black and Latino. And, um, and that might have been okay culturally, but in terms of, you know, uh, you know, in terms of the, the education we got, it was really underdeveloped. Mm. So I, I, you know, it's something I was very bitter about for a long time that my high school experience, um, you know, was, was, was underwhelming, you know, and it was really a place to survive because then you're adding in the violence that would occasionally happen in the school. This is when the crack scare was happening in New York City in mid late 1980s. So, you know, my attitude towards schooling was to go in and get out and not get beat up. And that's not an exaggeration, right? So I had to kind of, so for me, sport literature, playing sports like baseball became my, my way of sort of, you know, learning, you know, learning history, you know, the way that I could uh, and learning about culture. And also, you know, by being an athlete, you know, I wasn't a star, but I played baseball. So I, you know, I learned about, you know, I, I, I gained a kinesthetic uh knowledge in a lot of ways, right? Which is also very valuable. I, I write in the preface to my last book that it was really on the pitcher's mound that I found myself, you know, mm-hmm. playing baseball in the Bronx in the eighties, more so than having some incredible moment in high school. The incredible moments for me in education really happened in college and, and afterwards in, in graduate school. Right. After grad school, you, you obviously be, become a professor. Um, mm-hmm. Is the, you know, the old adage about publish or perish, is that more is that still a thing is that more uh you know more important than ever how does that work this idea of you know teaching at the same time as having to having to publish well it depends on the on the path that you take uh once you have your phd right so if you're teaching at what's known in the academic world and research one institutions right public institutions that you know put a real emphasis on research first and then pedagogy second um like the jobs I've had pretty much, University of Texas, and certainly this one at Columbia. Um, certainly, if you're going to succeed in academia, you have to be productive and you have to write and research and publish, for sure. Um, uh, so, you know, that that system has changed though dramatically for a variety of reasons that we won't get into here because of the ways in which most faculty who teach college students today are not tenure track, they're not permanent, they're adjunct faculty. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's a major problem that's uh, afflicting academia. Um, but... Even with that, um, there are a lot of us here who care about teaching. You know, I've gotten two teaching awards, not because I'm great, but I do care about teaching. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I would submit to you that most of many people who I, you know, I work with over the years are committed to doing the, the transformative work in the classroom. Sure. And because, I mean, for me, that was, I wanted to get into academia because I wanted to be like my professor. I, you know, I just love the idea of, of opening up people's minds and learning from your students the way I saw my professors do it as an undergraduate, right? So, um, so, so, so I've been able to kind of maintain both a commitment to teaching and doing the research and writing. Um, and we're doing a host of other things, like running the university. <laughs> okay. uh, um, okay. but, uh, but no question. So, but if you're at a small liberal arts school, like, uh, you know, Vassar College, like uh, Barnard College here, which is the, the women's college here right across the street from Columbia, where I, where I work now, um, you know, there's more emphasis on teaching. Right. So you have to really demonstrate your excellence as a teacher, as, a, as in pedagogy, you know, and then you also have to write. But the, the demands to publish are lesser uh, at a school like that than at a so-called research one institution. But that doesn't mean that we work harder. It just means that the emphasis is a little different. And, and so it really depends on where you're teaching. Sure. You know, we're trained to be the knowledge producers who write and publish. Uh, and then depending upon where you land with your job, if you get a job and I've been blessed to be able to get jobs you know, then that determines your kind of path in terms of how productive you are as a, as a writer researcher or, or how effective you are as a teacher. And maybe more importantly, there's also ratemyteacher.com, right? 
Yeah. <laughs> you, gotta, you know. <laughs> like, well, I really I try not to pay attention to the rate rate. Uh, uh, by, uh, I don't yeah. I don't really try not to look at that. Not because I don't value students' opinions, <laughs> but I think a forum like that is not the best place to look for uh, assessments yeah. of teaching right. of, of professors. You can you can plead the fifth on this if you like. Do you read your uh, Goodreads and all that? The Goodreads reviews. Uh you know, no, I don't. Okay. No, no, I don't. No, I, I really try to stay focused. <laughs> Watch this generic uh, transition here. Speaking of books, eh, eh, eh. Uh, man, these long titles for nonfiction, Forging Diaspora, <laughs> Afro-Cubans and African-Americans in a World of Empire and Jim Crow. Yes. Uh, how much of the seeds of the book maybe were on your, your personal, you know, having yes. Caribbean background? How much of that was a strictly research-based? You know, what were some of the seeds for the book? So that book was a, you know, an academic book, a monograph published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2010, written for scholars and students in the university setting, uh, because this goes to your early, the, the question you raised earlier about Publish of Paris, you know, in order for you to, to basically get tenure in academia, you have to be able to publish a book that uh, is considered a, a scholarly contribution mm -hmm. first. Right. Uh, and so, um, however, as a historian, you know, you know, we can still tell stories. You know, the beauty of us is that we don't have to write in a jargonistic way, thankfully. Uh, and I'd like to think that that book is less jargonistic than others, although I'm probably wrong. Um, <laughs> but to get to your question, yes, of course, the, the roots of that book, right? Uh, were certainly rooted in my in my in the questions that came out of my upbringing as a Caribbean person, a black Latino Caribbean person growing up in New York City. But it was definitely based on research. It had to be, uh, and it was a book that was really trying to understand, you know, like a basic question. Take it out of the academic context. How do people from different backgrounds perceive commonality? Okay, mm -hmm. so in the book, I'm trying to understand how in the first half of the 20th century when Cuba and the United States were intertwined in ways that they're not now because oh, yeah. of the legacies of the Cold War. This is when Cuba was a neo-colony in the United States from 1898 until the, Cash the revolution that put Fidel Castro in power in 1959. Uh, in that period, Cuba and the U.S. were, you know, tied very closely, right, uh, in all sorts of ways. Uh, and, and one of the ways they were tied together was that the black populations in Cuba and the United States knew a lot about each other's struggles, knew a lot about each other's cultures, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and also inspired each other's artistic movements, political movements, social movements. And so, you know, I'm in an archive in, in um, Cien Fuegos, Cuba in 1915, you know, a small town in the interior of the island. And uh, I'm seeing these references to Booker T. Washington, the very famous African-American leader in the, in the Cien Fuegos press. I'm seeing references to African-American institutions. And I'm like, well, how are Cubans you know, of all colors, but certainly of African descent, becoming aware of who Booker T. Washington is, right? Mm -hmm. How does that happen? Mm -hmm. And so my book really became about those connections that were forged across linguistic and national borders. And because these are people who were, you know, Black African-Americans and Afro-Cubans, descendants of, of enslaved peoples, you know, they had this history of slavery that was common, but unique to its own place. Sure. And yet they learned about each other's struggles for equality. And that's really what the book became about, about that, how these populations learned about each other, inspired each other's political activism and social movements and cultural movements like the Harlem Renaissance and the Afro-Cubanist movement, et cetera. And, uh, and that's what the book became about. And I wanted to tell that story. And so that became, you know, an exercise of uncovering, you know, all sorts of things in Cuban archives in the island and HBCU archives in this country, like at Tuskegee Institute and other places as well. Uh, and, um, and so the, you know, so diaspora as a concept really is, is allows us to understand how displaced populations experiencing forced displacement from the slave trade, in the case of people of African descent, find constitute commonality in the aftermath of that trauma. And that's what that book became about. Yeah, that's what it was about. And I think um, I didn't presume because they're Black, they necessarily had the similar identity or similar understanding of who they were as people. I, had, I wanted to show how that emerged historically over time. Hmm. I'm, I'm sure there's, it's probably almost impossible to, to quantify, but you know, even the word diaspora, like, is that, I'm not, is that a newish word as in like, mm -hmm. you know, with, with technology, with more connection and with more years in between, like as history goes on, right? Yes. There's more time where the diaspora could, you know, theoretically get, you know, farther apart, I guess you'd say. Yes. And, you know, the, the term really comes out of the Jewish experience, right? Of right, displacements yeah. of various kinds. And then it be, right. became adopted to the African diaspora, people who were descendants of people who, who, 
uh, who, you know, were try who experienced the trauma of the Atlantic slave trade and other slave trades, not just the Atlantic slave trade. So it became, you know, at the time I was writing that book, it became a kind of fashionable concept to understand this history of connectivity in the aftermath of trauma. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, it's not so much in fashion now for a variety of reasons. I won't bore you with all the details. That's an academic discussion. <laughs> but uh, but certainly it allowed me to understand, um, you know, certainly the technological aspects of how that becomes possible. Absolutely. So everything from, you know, um, you know, one of the things that happens uh, between Cuba and the U.S. is just a, the, the velocity of travel between the two countries really accelerates after the Spanish-American War, after Cuba becomes a neo-colony of the United States in 1902. And um, so things like, uh, yeah, radio, things like, uh, you know, steamship travel, things like obviously the circulation of the press, the creation of black presses in both countries. Those become the kind of mechanisms by which ideas circulate, right? Um, uh, or read in front of uh, not less literate audiences, right? Although the literacy rates of Afro-Cubans were never super low, actually. It's interesting. That's a side note. But yes, yeah, so... So connectivity, we think of, if you think about the 21st century, you know, you, if you want to look at diasporas today, I mean, just look at the internet, look at social media, look at the ways in which people are connected to these technologies. And one could do a similar analysis of that dynamic with earlier technologies, in, the, in my case, the first half of the 20th century. Right. Um, the, from, the, uh, from one of the reviews of the book, it's, quote, why did Afro-Cubans and African-Americans seek out each other's communities during the first half of the 20th, 20th century? How does the concept of diaspora enhance our understanding of these initiatives? Um, and as well as, quote, the connections between African-Americans and Afro-Cubans developed as a result of a common striving to combat racism locally as well as globally. Um, Garidi advances the idea that, quote, Afro-diasporic, am I saying that word mm -hmm. right? Direct? Afro-diasporic. Diasporic, mm -hmm. linkages were made in practice, et cetera. Um, I, I think about it a little bit through the sports lens. I think of mm -hmm. like, I don't know, Minnie Minoso, I think of mm -hmm. like, oh, yes. right? like, 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 well, not Jim Crow, well, Jim Crow laws that kept, what was it always called? The gentleman's agreement, right? Yes. They in, kept in baseball history. They kept people of African descent out of baseball, right? Yes. And then there's just like, well, does that include the Cubans? And I know there were like, you know, white presenting or European presenting. Yes. Played. Um, how much did sports come into, into play there? I'm also thinking of like recently, you know, you know, in the world of Twitter, you never know what's a big story or not. <laughs> like I saw it in my little corner for like a day and I'm like, but Yasiel Puig came out recently, right? With like, a, yes, looks like, like he said, you know, hey, I'm not, I want someone to translate this for me in English. It's not my best language. But basically saying like, on one hand, like, hey, hire me, you know, bring me back into the majors. But also something that I've always wondered about and seems to be so true is that Caribbean baseball, for example, is so different than the United States, right? Yes. And then American baseball. Yes. And that's literal ignorance where it's like Americans like, oh, you know, he, what, a, what a hot dog, what a flashy yes. type of guy. Right. So I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this, but I guess well, the connections you, you see like with sports. Oh, it's huge. And I didn't write about that at the time. In fact, one of my dear friends and colleagues from Michigan, uh, my graduate program, Adrian Burgos wrote the book or one of the books on the mm -hmm. subject, uh, Playing America's Game. You should have him on your podcast. Oh, yeah. um, okay, okay. Uh, in which he looks at the experiences of Latino players from the Caribbean in the Negro Leagues, in the major leagues mm -hmm. during the era of, of segregation until Jackie Robinson breaks the color line in 1947, then afterwards, right? Um, and how many of the first black players in the major leagues were people of Caribbean descent, like Mini Minoso, uh, who was just inducted to the Hall of Fame, finally, hey, hey. who was the first Black player for the Chicago White Sox, right? So, you know, Blackness was not just African-Americans. There was people, Latinos from the Caribbean, right? Which, which he talks about in that book and others have as well. So, yeah, sports, the baseball diamond for sure, but even track, um, if you look at the track and field scenes at the time, you know, little bits of evidence of, you know, Black women who were running in in uh in track and field competitions or running against black cuban women in these different you know international competitions so that's just a side note but certainly baseball is a great example of the ways in which racism kept black people from different backgrounds out of the major leagues but because of the negro leagues and because of the caribbean leagues you know black players could play in the negro leagues you know underpaid and not with the same exposure that certainly their white uh, um you know um uh, fellow ball players could but then they played in the dominican republic and in cuba and puerto rico and mexico and venezuela on and on i mean my grandfather experienced that you know himself as a baseball fan in in the caribbean in the 1950s so um so yeah that that becomes its own kind of network its own sort of diasporas that tie communities together and it, it does even in the midst of 
the different cultural backgrounds and linguistic backgrounds, they are sharing this experience of discrimination that, mm. you know, also fosters, in the case of the Caribbean, integration, because there were no, uh, you know, Jim Crow laws that uh, prohibited the white and black players from playing each other in the, in the Caribbean. And so that's why you have this robust Caribbean baseball culture that dri- derives from black cultures and Caribbean cultures. And that's why baseball is distinct, uh, uh, yeah. as I've experienced myself uh, in Cuba, uh, than you would see in the U.S. for sure. Definitely. Um, quite an accomplishment. You know, you can go ahead and, uh, you know, get, get some water, go bake a pizza by the time I'm reading this title. No, it's not that long. This is not that long. <laughs> right. The sports revolution. This is to my what right shoulder here. The sports revolution, how Texas changed the culture of American athletics. The, the best sports books are not about sports. Uh, the best culture books, you know, I don't know what your book is, uh, is about sports ostensibly, but it's about so much more. Um, and, you know, what a, I guess it's always a good time for a book like this, but there have been, you know, so many, so much of an idea of, of athletes is more autonomous, whether it's with, you know, the vaccine stuff recently, <laughs> but, you know, more so, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter and, you know, shut up and dribble type of things like that, right? I mean, I always have trouble calling, calling somebody saying stop being racist. I have trouble calling that political, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, well, you know, quote unquote political things. Um, and speaking of Kareem, you know, Kareem always talked about standing on the shoulders of giants. Yes. yes. I wonder, this is a long way, I guess, of asking where the book came from. Did it, did it come from the athletes first? Did it come from like, mm-hmm. you know, these social movements? Did it come from like Texas, Texas? Yeah. What were the seeds? All from? the above. All the above. All the above. Because yeah. so I lived in Texas. I taught at the University of Texas, Austin, when I started this book. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um Certainly, the book is a product of my experience um, living and working there. Uh, my wife is also a, a Mexican American from Texas, so I, you know, I got to know the place, uh, certain kinds of Texas, in a very intimate way. Mm. Uh, having taught Texans for eleven years uh, and really enjoying my time there, um, so there's no question uh, that the book would have never happened if I didn't teach at the University of Texas Austin, <laughs> uh, because you know Texas is not on my radar as a snobby northeasterner. Uh, and then I wound up living there for 11 years and my child was born there and, and I had an amazing experience there and was still connected to my in-laws there. Um, so there's that, um, you know, I, you know, this goes back to earlier parts of the discussion in the, in the sense that, you know, I decided after I wrote the Cuba book uh, that I wanted to write about sports. You know, it had been a childhood passion. Uh, uh, certainly I'm a fan of sports, but to me, sports says a lot about who we are as a society. Right. Uh, as a nation, as men, as women, as whites and blacks, as straight and queer people, et cetera, whatever our identity as working class people, whatever our identification is. It's a great way to see a lot of other questions. Mm-hmm. Right. In addition to what happened on the field itself or who's coaching or how many wins or losses, et cetera. Right. So so the so the book originated from an earlier passion in my life that I decided to make part of my professional life after I received tenure. Uh, and I decided to, to work on, on this project. So, uh, and then of course, as the book was taking shape, it was happening in the midst of this, of, this, of this moment of athlete activism that really takes off after the murder of Trayvon Martin, this, the Zimmerman verdict uh, and the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement, which is really the contemporary, just the latest version of the Black freedom struggle that goes back to, you know, since the era of slavery. Uh, and, and certainly seeing, you know, how the whole notion of sports being political become Evident, <laughs> evident clearly, you know, once uh, Colin Kaepernick and the WNBA players uh, decide to, and, and uh, Megan Rapino decide to take a knee and stand for uh, stand against police violence in 2016. So, you know, so that was certainly has been in the air for the last seven, eight years when I was essentially working on this book starting in 2013, for the most part, uh, with some stops in between. So um, so all of that played a role. Uh, in the in the shaping of of the book and 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 really in the end I but I, I think ultimately the book is trying to show you know by looking at Texas looking at a society that was steeped in Jim Crow segregation steeped in the legacies of conquest and colonization how sport helped catalyze a new era in Texas history right mm-hmm. catalyze desegregation catalyze the incorporation of women into sports right. Um, uh, catalyze the the growth of you know help catalyze the growth of these suburbanized metropolises with big fancy stadiums like the Houston Astrodome and Texas Stadium in Dallas and then there and then there's subsequent buildings afterwards um, and how that 
emerged from very particular Texas dynamics, but also emerged from the from the growth of the sports industry, you know, in this country. It's really in the 60s and 70s when sport becomes big business, when big money comes into sports. And that happens to coincide with the precise moment of the civil rights and the feminist movement. So my book is saying, well, huh, what if we put these things together? You know, how does it help us understand our, uh, you know, American society and how does it understand the role that sport played in it, right? Uh, and so that's, you know, that's what the book did. And I think those different forces, my own experiences, my own passion for sport, but also the, the context of our times certainly shaped the making of that book. Yeah, I mean, the great writing, you know, answers questions and it, and it brings up questions and, yeah. and yours for sure does. And the connections are incredible. The, the way that, you know, that the chapters just fit so well. I mean, it's obviously a natural like boundary or border, like, you know, obviously there are things that, that bleed into each other, but um, eight, it reminds you of like, I don't know if you've ever read Sam Quinones. No, no. Mm -mm. He wrote, he wrote um, about like the opioid epidemic and he's mm -mm. written a lot about Mexico. And, but it's just each chapter is its own story, but also, you know, also linked to the others. So before you were doctor, the seven-year-old you was watching this <laughs> momentous game, right? This was, you start off the book with, um, I want to say it was the Dolphins, right? Dolphins against the Oilers. Yes. And Monday Night Football, you know, which I, I still to this day, I'm like, have a trouble when people say it's a show like it's just a night and they play a game but it's just you know it's a show it's a series and there's just so much about that game that is so emblematic right it's that the astrodome the technology um houston as well i learned so much about houston through your book mm -hmm. that you know i've always been interested by it, but i don't feel like i know i mean it's what the fourth biggest city in the yes yes and and it's such a diverse place and it's absolutely such, you know and it's just i don't feel like i know too much about it other than you know um about the rockets and paul wall and mike jones and right right you know? <laughs> right yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah the thesis seems to be something to the effect of quote texan sporting cultures not only transform the u.s for better for work and for worse but they also help change the lone star state itself which was built on the violence of conquest slavery colonization and jim crow segregation which you talked about a lot about the rural and the metropolis as well um, and it's just brings so many things together. Chapter one is about sports in the shadow of segregation. I always remember when Ricky Williams, the running back yes. was, uh, maybe in his Heisman trophy years that there was like an, uh, an episode of, you know, wild world of sports, one of those with him and Doak Walker. Yes. Right. Who was, as you said, very much was representative of like the, the white, you know, football hero, you know, along with, you know, the cheerleader, the, the woman and, you know, representative of that, you know, the, the perfect athlete, the perfect, you know, clean cut type of guy. This, these were the times of, of Jim Crow, whether it was, you know, um, regulated or, you know, law or not. Um, and then guys like Royal, what, what's his first name? Please remind me. Darrell Royal, the legendary head football coach of the Texas Longhorns. Right. And Broyles at Arkansas and Gene yes. Stallings. I mean, these guys held on for years before they segregated, right? Yes. They integrated, excuse me. Yes. Right. Yet yes. they were. Yet they were legends. Yes, and they still are, and in they, fo in football terms for sure. And they yes. still are, and they yes. still are. Yeah. Chapter two is about um, spaceships land in the Texas prairie. Some incredible characters. <laughs> Roy Hoffines. Am I saying that right? Yes, Hoffines. Yes. You know, I think a lot of us know about the Hunt, Lamar Hunt, Tex Schramm, and you know Houston and its African American community and others were so key in these protests. Yes. Basically saying, okay, you're building this new place. Uh, you know, Bud Adams, I want to say, was very slow to to integrate. The owner of the Houston Oilers, correct. Right. Mm -hmm. And the Astrodome mm -hmm. was like, yes. And I wonder how much of that you saw as altruistic. Yeah. And how much it was, we want to make money. Well, the story of integration or, or desegregation, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, it, it's always a combination of motives. It's a combination, right? What in whatever situation you're looking at, whether it's in sports or the segregation of schooling or whatever it is, is there's political motives, there's economic motives, and then then there's real, genuine transformations that people experience, right? For, based on their own journeys, personal journeys, mm -hmm. and that's the case certainly with you looking at the collapse of Jim Crow uh, segregation in Texas athletics and in other parts of the South uh, and all over the country, right? Um, that was the case when. Branch Rickey signed uh, Jackie right. Robinson to play for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, yeah, he certainly had a moral compass and he was uncomfortable, although he tolerated segregation for a long time. But he decided in the late 1940s that it was time for black athletes and it was time for the Dodgers mm 
to, to compete. And the best way to compete is to tap into the, to the black talent that was in the Negro Leagues. And that dynamic happens over and over and over again, right? And, and because these are professional franchises or because they're college athletic programs, because I look at both college and professional sports in this book, you know, there's always an economic motive. There's always a motive to win games, right? Uh, and that's all part of the dynamic right in my book and in every story of desegregation mm -hmm. and you can see that right now when if you look at what has transpired over the last few years and certainly in 2020 where corporate interests you know have decided that they stand at least rhetorically for black lives matter uh if not in substance uh and we've seen this kind of upsurge of interest in in uh, in police violence and slavery and racism and anti-racism and uh, anti-racist work it's certainly that has been prompted by genuine transformation that people experienced last year in particular after the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. But it's also because, uh, you know, Black Lives is profitable <laughs> for corporations. And, and, and the way to maintain the, the bottom line is to show you're not racist, at least in some segments of the corporate corporate America, right? And so we, we see that even now, right? Um, and that was certainly the case in, in Texas in the 60s and 70s. And yet, you know, Texas, uh, you know, the South uh, held on to segregation, you know, uh, you know, certainly the Texas Longhorns, you know, the last all white college football championship team were the Texas Longhorns coached by Daryl Royal, who you mentioned earlier in 1969. Uh, you know, uh, he, you know, he took a long time to embrace integration and, to, and, and, and the program suffers as a result. What I talk about in the book is that the schools that integrated first tend to be more successful uh, and, they, and they wound up overtaking the Texas Longhorns, at least in the in the college football scene in Texas, University of Houston and Southern Methodist University in particular. Uh, and it takes a long time for the Longhorns to recover uh, yeah. from. And, I, and part of what I argue is that because they were slow to integrate the black athlete where their where their rivals were not. Mm. Right. So um, so it's 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 so it is and it is absolutely true that certain coaches, administrators, you know, had their eureka moment and they realized, OK, now is that, you know, the days of segregation are over. But they're having that moment because they see that there's a profitable future for their programs in sports. And that's certainly the case in the 1960s and 70s and it is to this day. Right. You you called chapter three, The Outlaws, and it talks about mm -hmm. like Hay Hayden Fry was with Houston, right? He's with the Southern Methodists. He's Sorry. the one who signed the first, uh, Jerry Levias, the first right. uh, uh, black football player, scholarship athlete in the Southwestern Conference. The old, the predecessor was today the Big 12. Right. And, you know, uh, Rodrigo Barnes was one of the players. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously, mm -hmm. unfortunately, so many connections today, this, you know, he was outspoken, which was, you know, Muhammad Ali got it. Cassius Clay got it. Like yep. there's a different scale if you're an outspoken, you know, black athlete. No and doubt. Even, and even outspoken probably, right, is is so much in the eye of the beholder. Um, but, you know, you talk about the, all those sports biographies you read as a kid, and I was the same. I mean, just devoured them. Just, And I always remember like the Jackie Robinson one, which was, mm -hmm. you know, obviously written mm -hmm. for younger, younger people. But um, I remember being so struck by – this darn light going off. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I remember being so struck by when he, when Branch Rickey, and again, maybe it was kind of dr dramatized for the book, but when Branch Rickey said, basically, you can be yourself now, 1948, 1949, I don't know. Right. Like you don't need to be mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. you know, avoiding every fight. You don't need to be the, the man about town, the, you know, elegant, graceful. And you described that so well with Jerry, pronounce it Levias? Levias, Levias, yes. About how he, what a great story, but he was not happy. And, you know, he was, he was forced, you know, pretty much forced to be like, you better not mess up. I mean, what a, you know, the, the whole, you know, double standard and yes. had to be two times as better, you know, as good as his white uh, uh, teammates and that kind of thing. But that was really moving to me and really um, uh, a light bulb moment. You know. He he gives a great interview a couple of years ago, and it's, it was in the SMU library, and, and a very powerful, moving interview in which he talks about, you know, here he is a football legend. He becomes very successful. Uh, he's 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 successful after his career ends. Uh, he's an All American at SMU. He he does everything that SMU wanted and more on the football field, and he graduated. You know, he was an exemplar student athlete. Mm -hmm. And yet he had to endure so much racism and he had to keep it to himself. And he lost, as he says in that interview, the, the ability to feel because he felt the pressure, right, to perform and that he realized he messed up or spoke out. Then, you know, the experiment of him playing for the Mustangs of SMU would end badly. Mm. But there were consequences. And really, whether it's Jackie Robinson or Jerry Levias or any integration pioneer in any setting, 
experiences that dynamic, certainly at that time, and sometimes even now still, of how do you perform in front of a majority white audience? How do you show you're capable? How, how, but don't show too much because then you might disrupt the kind of arrangement you have that, that mm -hmm. set in place for integration. And, uh, and it's, a, it's its own traumatic experience. And so, you know, it wasn't until years later that he actually started to come to grips with that. And Jackie Robinson had the same experience. Right. And so many other, the integration athletes, pioneers in sports had that experience. And, you know, I, I've theorized that it's not by accident that some of these people died pretty young because they had to endure, yeah. you know, uh, the enormous strain of, 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 of being, a, a, you know, a pathbreaker. Uh, and we celebrate them today, but there were some serious consequences uh, for the result of the, of the decisions that they made. Uh, and, 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 and so I wanted to bring that dynamic out in the book. I did. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So, you know, in, in respecting your time, I just, uh, you know, we could talk for hours. I have I, I enjoy talking to you so much. There's so much goodness in this book. Um, you know, one of the th last things I'll leave you with is, uh, well, first of all, the idea of San Antonio and it's, I didn't know so much about his history mm -hmm. uh, with its baseline bums and all that. So cool. Um, you know, I've always, I was always a fan. I've always been a fan, you know, like many people with the Tony Parker Duncan days. Um, but so much about, about gender and gender politics and, you know, the cowboy cheerleaders, the world famous cowboy <laughs> cheerleaders. And I know inflation and this and that. Fifteen dollars a game. Yes, $15. they were a little underpaid, uh, to you say think? the least. <laughs> and they had yes. to, you know, do their own laundry. And yes, you know, of course, uh, you know, mileage was not included. And so, you know, one of the great things about your book is it brings 1965, 1975. It's like that was not that long ago. Mm -hmm. And you know, when we're talking about labor issues and. I think was it Kurt Flood was was in the seventies as well. That's right, seventy seventy one. Yes. I mean, when we're talking about labor issues in twenty twenty one, yeah, the money's more, <laughs> but fifteen dollars, you know, with all the money they make off them, right? College, you know, Ohio State and these big schools, their in their endowment or how much they make from the athletic, and then we're like, hey, hey, you know what? You sold a picture of yourself that was autographed. Yes. And, you know, uh, did the connections are just all over the place, and then of course the battle of the sexes was bobby riggs was he how much of that was he playing up was he a legit um male know, chauvinist as he said over and over <laughs> was that was that a lot of entertainment was that hollywood stuff it's both i think it was both uh and it, you know and i and that's what i say in the book um certainly they were about you know for those who don't know the very famous tennis match between billy jean king the legendary uh, pioneering women tennis player and bobby riggs who was then a 55 year old uh, washed up former tennis player who was looking to make a buck my challenge billy jean king to a tennis match that had happened in the houston Astrodome in september 1973 and so um you know, they did the big time promotion. So yes, yeah, so they, right. You know, they, they, they beefed it up as uh, you know, the, the male chauvinist pig versus the women's liber. Right. And this is the era of early second wave feminism in the night in the United States, early 1970s. And certainly, yes, he played up the role, but uh, you know, it wasn't just him. The entire sport apparatus was sexist. Well, he <laughs> right. Wasn't, he wasn't acting that much. In other words, no, he no, he was playing up much. beliefs that it would, that were even that were held dearly by men who control the tennis world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's what I say over and over again, because it's not just him. It's all the men who picked him to beat this top conditioned woman at, at 29 years old, which is preposterous looking at it now. Hmm. But, but a lot of people believe that Riggs was going to beat uh, Billie Jean King. Um, so, um, so yeah, he played up his sexism, but I, I don't think that was just for show. I think that's because that's because the entire apparatus of the tennis world, as I say in the book was, was, was totally, you know, geared towards male domination. Uh, and so to understand that match, you have to understand actually the growth of the first women's professional tennis tour would take shape in Houston in 1970. Uh, 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 you know, if you put it in that context, you can see how the, the emergence of a king and these other players is perceived as a threat by the male dominated tennis establishment. And so Bobby Riggs becomes the kind of poster child, the symbol of that in 1973, but he was not the only one. Yeah. So, I mean, you see how the women's women's soccer, women's tennis, all women's sports. Yes. Now that fight is not that much different than the seventies where no. when, when people talk about the open era, like there wasn't, they didn't have the chance in the what, late sixties, early seventies to even make that much, if any money off. Correct. They were so restricted. Um, and what a great character, this Gladys Hedman. Heldman. Heldman. 
and H E L D M A N chain chain smoking and <laughs> the story about how Philip Morris became the sponsor and then became Virginia Slims is just is worth the the price of admission for that book on just on its own, right? Yeah, Hellman. You know, I think one of the things that I try to show in the book is that entrepreneurs play a big role in the story. They play a big role in making change happen. They're the ones who find the money. They're the ones who figure out how to put people together. And Gladys Hellman was one of these people oh, yeah. who, you know, had, you know, she was an Upper East Side Manhattan socialite who loved tennis and was committed to helping women's tennis, you know, grow as a professional sport in the early 70s. And it was her visionary leadership, that, along with the talents and the commitment of the athletes themselves, that made it happen. And I think that's a big part of the story, that entrepreneurs play a key role in the business of sport, especially when the business of sport is geared towards something else aside from generating profit. Mm. And that's the thing. I think so many of those entrepreneurs had a bigger vision than just money making. You know, they saw even even if, you know, for even Lamar Hunt, the very wealthy son of the oil baron, of the Texas Hunt family, had a vision for sport in Texas society. Right. Roy Hoffines had a vision beyond, oh, I just want to make money off of my team. They believe that sport brought something to a community and they were right. You know, uh, and I still believe that even as commercialized and commodified as sport is today, uh, it's in, and I think that's because they were coming into the era of being sport entrepreneurs in the midst of these social movements, the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, the Chicano movement, the anti-war movement that was making these social causes visible. And they become fused, you know, with the sporting cultures that are emerging in that period. And I think that's why they're able to see that beyond their own visionary, you know, um, you know, their visions of what sport could be is that they're, they're coming of age in a moment of tremendous change in our country. And they were influenced by it. And, they, and that some of that gets infused into the entrepreneurship that they that they that they set out and they change American sporting culture as a result. No doubt about it. I mean, Texas is almost like his own character in the book. And, and so is Houston. Um, yeah. Like you, you, you write about there there seems to be like lacking the great five slamma jamma story. Mm -hmm. Your chapter eight is pretty dang good, right? It's like, <laughs> you know, um, Thank you. was it Fondy? If, is it pronounced Fondy? Fondy or? Recreation Center. Yes. You know, um, and just that, that very specific Houston lifestyle as a whole, the, the basketball lifestyle there, the very insular in a, in a positive way, community, you know, basketball wise and other. Um, and again, like I said, just a city we don't know about, but, you know, Clyde Drexler and, and everything that happened at Houston in those days, it was so interesting. And you finish with uh, the revolution undone, <laughs> um, which is probably emblematic of the country as a whole, right? Like you said, big money gets involved. The, uh, the social causes kind of get, you know, uh, what's the word, just um, watered down, right? And, you know, with the boom and bust specifically in Texas with oil and such, you know, some of these these causes are are muted at the very least. Right. And then it becomes, you know, more corporate and, you know, money gets involved, like I said, in cable and television. And and now I think what University of Texas probably has their own their own uh, network or something like. Right? Oh, yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. They have their own tele the, the Longhorn network. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. They're, you know, whereas and more programs have their own networks now, you know, right. that's absolutely true. Yeah, you're exactly right. And I think that, um, yeah, what I argue in the book is that by the 1980s, like that, that, that very delicate balance of social causes, social movements with the growth of the sports business gets tipped over much more to the business side. That's mm -hmm. what I say. Yeah. And, and some of the athletes are benefiting from that. Certainly the most talented ones who are lucky. But the vast majority of athletes are not, <laughs> right? I, I think and the ones who are the real winners of the sports revolution, you could argue, aside from the uh, Clyde Drexler and a great player like that, are the coaches and the athletic directors and the and the media yes, and yes, the yes. and the and the dudes who run sport, mm -hmm. right? They're the primary beneficiaries. And that, how else can you explain the growth, the gigantic growth of the sport management class and the media class today, dominated by men, mostly white men? So. Um, yeah, that's 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 what I say. And I, you can see signs of that clearly in the 1980s when college football coaches start getting their big contracts. Uh, and there's just endless examples like that I talk about or a number of examples, not endless uh, in the book. Um, and the other thing I want to say just quickly is that I want people who don't think about Texas, don't care about Texas to get another side of Texas society than I think that they get, you know, um, and not to say that I know the real Texas, I'm not saying that, but having been immersed in, in the culture, having, you know, married to Mexican American, you know, very active also in kind of local social movements in Austin with the black, uh, you know, black communities in Austin when I lived there, 
you know, Texas is way more interesting than the national stereotype suggests. And they have their own histories of struggles. They have their own histories of uh, fascinating people who've made, you know, who changed this country. Uh, and and I want them, I want people to think about Mexican Americans and African Americans and white people in a different way. And I think that's and you know I didn't talk about indigenous peoples, but you could extend it to them and other groups as well. And so uh, you know my hope is that somebody based in Sacramento like you would say, oh wow, I didn't know that. I didn't know Texas had a history like this. And I think yeah. that that's what I was trying to do with this book also. No doubt about it. Um, you you make that great point about the coaches and the salaries and the money. Um, I teach a short piece in one of my classes um, it's called something to the effect of it's basically about like comparing University of Texas, specifically their football program to the Asian studies program. Mm. <laughs> and it's such a cool like juxtaposition, like such and such is, you know, a world renowned teacher of Vietnamese. Right. He gets paid this much. Yes. You know, at the time, I think it was Mac Brown, you know, coach, you know, and it's just straight like head to head. Yes. And it's like, oh, my gosh, you know, just you know, and it's nothing new and I'm not saying something original, but like, obviously it's so skewed towards sports, 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 sports. Yes. And the studies are, you know, that's right. And sports as business. And, you know, and, and again, in the university setting, having taught at the university of Texas, I saw that firsthand, you know, uh, you know, and I think institution, thankfully it's different. Uh, sport doesn't dominate our culture here at Columbia. And that's, and that's a good thing. At least the, the business of sport does not, um, right. We have sports teams, and I think that's great. Um, but uh, there's no question that, yeah, the the I mean, you, you look no further than Texas to see how skewed our priorities are, and not just Texas, obviously, um, mm -hmm. around you know how much you know sport administrators and coaches make, and some athletes make, uh, as opposed to people who do impactful or more impactful work, and they don't. And that's an unfortunate legacy of that era because before that, you know, legendary coaches, you know, they got paid modestly. They didn't get paid big bucks. Guy Lewis is a longtime uh, head basketball coach at the University of Houston. You know, he's making twenty, thirty thousand dollars until the 1980s. You know, and he was there for, you know, several decades. Right. I mean, that's a good salary, but that's not what uh, coaches make today. Nine, ten million dollars a year in some programs. Right. So. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that you're, you know, in order to understand this dynamic that you're talking about with your students now, you have to look back at this period. And that's that's what I'm trying to do in this book to see, you know, how how things went wrong, <laughs> I think, in some ways, in a lot of ways, you know, I think you, I'm sure you have a lot more to add to the discourse. What uh, what are you working on these days, if you don't mind sharing? Oh, no, absolutely. I'll say briefly, I, I'm not done with sports. So I'm writing a book about mm -hmm. stadiums in America. I want to understand why do we build them? Why do we why did cities perceive that they needed to build them? Uh, you know, uh, why do they play such a role in urban political economies? Why do they become important kind of community gathering spaces for sports and for concerts and for political rallies? Uh, and so that's what my next book is about. It's contracted with basic books. Uh, so it won't be an academic book <laughs> like this one was not an academic book either. Uh, and I want to understand this institution, this phenomenon that, mm. you know, we can't get rid of. Uh, and, and yet there's a fascinating history of protests and social movements. So what we've seen in recent years, or whether it's Colin Kaepernick or Megan Rapinoe or whoever, protests, you know, creating, you know, all sorts of noise and energy, um, you know, in, in, in our politics, there's a deep history around social movements uh, in stadiums, because there are these important, you know, gathering places for communities. And I want to understand that story better. So that's, that's my current book right now. Right. There's no, I mean, there's no Colin Kaepernick without, I don't know if they were in the new stadium at the time or without the without the stadium and the whole deal. No, right? That's exactly right. And because it's this magnifier, right? It makes things visible because of the way in which the, you know, the architecture of the stadium works. So yes, absolutely. This is a great book. You can see my little bookmarks. That's my, my form of annotation. Um, <laughs> any, any independent bookstores, any favorite bookstores you recommend? Uh, give, you know, give your contact info, if you would, your, your social media. Sure. I'm, I'm easy to find. I'm on Twitter at F Gritty. F is a Frank, my last name, G U R I D Y. Um, you know, if you don't have a local bookstore, certainly bookshop uh, is, is the way to go. You know, if, if I mean, if to avoid the Amazon behemoth. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's what I usually recommend. I'm easily to, easy to find on, on. You can just Google me and I, and I show up pretty quickly. So, um, yeah. So, yeah. And, and, and I think if you look for a holiday gift and does you have a, a dad or, or mom or somebody who likes sports, this book might be uh, might be interesting to them. Oh, man. Uh, such a pleasure talking to you. Like I said, we could go on for hours. I'd be listening mostly, um, <laughs> but, but really appreciate your time. And um, so cool to talk to somebody who's a sports fan, but also understands that sports is so connected to, to everything. Right. And it's, uh, it's just, uh, 
is something that can be used to discuss so many other topics. So it's been a pleasure talking to you and I wish you great luck in the future. Well, thank you so much. It was a real delight to talk to you and uh, best, uh, best wishes to you on the podcast and everything else you're doing. Appreciate it so much. Thank you. Take care.